think we're ready to get started for the second uh, session the morning. And uh, this, this speaker is Yuraki Matsui from UC Davis. And he will be speaking about dynamic uh, subgrip scale modeling for dynamo simulation in a rotating spherical shell modeled on the Earth's outer core. Oops. <laughs> yes, I found uh, my original title was too long. <laughs> I made a little bit of simplified. Does it work? Yep. <laughs> All right. So thanks for having the chance to make talk in this workshop. I very appreciate for it. And actually yesterday, so Rakesh and Nick had a good introduction for the geodynamic simulations. This guy, no printer. Yes? Oops. <laughs> well, that's OK. I don't need that. OK. start again so yeah so Nick for the start Nick and uh, Rakesh had a good introduction for the uh, new maker dynamos from the uh, Earth's core yesterday so this guy is an example you know my new maker dynamo results uh, with the finest case in uh, which I have so the uh, Ekman number is a 10 minus 5 and my number is a 0 0.25 and so actual Bautisti has a very small scale features. And uh, here's a polar view of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field has a little bit larger scale. And so the fan intense magnetic field is generally so the field to go away. So the small scale features uh, disappear here. The intense magnetic field is generated. But it's this parameter is still far away from the you know, actual ashes cores and uh, Ekman number of parameters, on, uh, which is uh, 10 part minus 15 or something like It's still way off. Then, so on, uh, ashes cores should have strong turbulent. And probably we can't resolve such small scale futures and uh, effect on such turbulence. In uh, directory in a numerical simulation in the near future, then so we need to put some uh, turbulence modeling, some good scaling, to to model uh, such a small scale process in uh, for the large scale dynamos. And in a numerical dynamo, we have to care about the uh, heat of flux, momentum flux, wind force. Magnetic induction. There are many times. Né? There are many nonlinear times. Né? And so after getting getting applying the SS model successfully, so then we can also understand what process, what the turbulence process is happening to the large scale field by looking at the this results of the SS model. Actually, so not so many turbulence models are applied for the uh, numerical dynamos. So, uh, but uh, not so many, or uh, everything has. So, the uh, turbulence diffusivity, some part, we always apply it. But this guy, the turbulence viscosity, is uh, always iso isotropic. And so, here's a fast simulation, fast successful dynamo by Gagliat's Maya and Roberts. And still, on uh, many dynamo model is a uh, hyper diffusivity, which is a uh, increase in uh, diffusivity for a uh, large wave number, small scale features. Né? And so, uh, during orbit, uh, suggested hyper diffusivity still work, should work fine for the uh, if we apply it, uh, it in a very very small scale. And actually, so on a uh, hyper diffusivity is still isotropic. Then, so on uh, so 
Evers or Matsushima investigate uh, isop isotropic diffusivities using the uh, closure modeling, but it's still ongoing. And so we choose access on uh, this work is a collaboration with uh, Bruce Buffett. So, uh, uh, we choose a scale similarity model to apply a sub scale model for uh, our dynamic model. In uh, 2003, Bruce Buffett applied a uh, scale similarity model for uh, periodic uh, vertical walls. And then, so, uh, Martin and Buffett also applied uh, construct and subject scale modeling for the spherical shell dynamo model using the finite element method. But honestly, we meet a we meet a problem. FEM is very very slow, much much slower than the uh, spherical Hamsey expansion dynamo models. Then somewhat, we can run uh, fully resolved dynamo simulation directly with a in a uh, spherical shell dynamo. It's a little bit uh, terrible situation for us. Then, so we decide to implement uh, this scale similarity model into a uh, uh, numerical dynamo using a uh, spherical harmonic expansion. So, in, the, in starting, what's the scale similarity model? So, we start to, what we look at uh, what we treat on a field in uh, numerical simulations. So there's a limit of the spatial resolution in the numerical, numerical model. So, uh, so what we treat in, uh, some filtered field of the uh, actual field by the uh, grid spacing. Then, so uh, here's a uh, these uh, uh, filtering by a grid spacing, which we can treat directly, but so now we have to treat uh, this filtered field in uh, numerical simulations. Considering uh, this process, so we need to describe nonlinear terms with an uh, additional term. So uh, if we apply a uh, filtering operation for a uh, whole heat equation, for example, so we can't treat a uh, uh, filtered heat flux directly. Then so, uh, we have to describe heat flux using uh, obtained by a uh, filtered field, and then so, uh, uh, add the uh, difference between these two as an uh, additional term. That's a uh, HS term in uh, numerical simulations. Then we get back to the uh, governing equations for the uh, summary driven dynamo. So there are four nonlinear terms, so the uh, advections and uh, Lorentz force and heat flux and magnetic induction. And so there are four corresponding HS terms are required. And these guys, are described these equations, but actually, so the fan I implement to uh, this scale SS model into a uh, spectral shell dynamo. So we have to change. We have to use a uh, different uh, formulations for the uh, advection uh, SS momentum flux and uh, SS Lorentz force uh, from the. Uh, FM dynamo using a Cartesian coordinate. Then actually, so, uh, I didn't, I wonder so, uh, if we can get the same results by using uh, these formulations in a uh, new, uh, new scale similarity dynamo models. And so we need to model this scale similarity, scale, uh, SS terms by scale similarity model. What's a scale similarity model? So, uh, we assume effect of the unresolved field, here's a truncation, unresolved field to the resolved field would be a larger scale in the unresolved scale. And so the effect of the, this uh, unresolved scale would be similar to the small scale but resolved component. Then, so the, 
we apply a little bit wider filter function than uh, grid spacing or truncation. Uh, truncation. And then so, uh, pick up the small scale component and reconstruct the easy stamps from the, this filtered field. And then so, there's some uh, difference of the amplitude. So we need to add uh, some uh, model coefficient to adjust amplitude of the easy stamps. Then, yeah, we have to evaluate this model coefficient to apply in a scale symmetry model. Oops, there's another slide, sorry. <laughs> and one good thing in, uh, by using the speaker, share, speaker harmonic expansion model, so we can set such a special filtering using a, in a spectrum space. So, jerky. Jerky it also construct a filtering model for the spectral harmonic expansion, and then so the, we can we carry in this model to describe the filter function, the filter op filtering operation for the, each field, and then so we need to evaluate this model question. So the uh, Germano so has proposed a good uh, approach called uh, Germano's identity. So uh, we consider uh, SDS terms with a, with a different filter lens. And then so, uh, we take the uh, difference between them so that uh, we can get the uh, yeah, same shape of the uh, SDS terms which can obtain, which can evaluate it from the uh, simulation results. And then, so uh, we apply a uh, scale symmetry model for uh, these two terms. And then, so the uh, unknown parameter will be only in uh, this model quotient. So this model quotient can depend on the characteristics of the uh, field, uh, field on the velocity or temperature and magnetic field. Then, so uh, we set, uh, actually we set more finer. Uh, the grouping along with uh, zonal directions, and then evaluate the model coefficient as a function of radius and light shield direction, theta direction. So, it has a quick, uh, quick introduction of the code which I implemented, Calypso, and which is also supported by the computational infrastructure for the geodynamics, GIGE, and it's also highly parallelized. Uh, I tested up to uh, yeah, 38,000 uh, cores, and it also has a large flexibility. But honestly, I haven't released the um, model, including the, this current uh, SS model. So it's only accept for uh, direct simulations. So then so now we check if my model works, our scale symmetry model works correctly, then so now so we compare three cases. One is uh, free reasonable simulations, so the, the, with a fine, fine resolutions and simply continuing. And we get the snapshot results from the core steady state, and then so the interpolate the course grid and the, run the unresolved DNS without the SS model and run the LES, including the scale similar key model. And actually today, I introduced two cases. One is a case one with a pretty large ECMA number. So the ECMA number is a 10 part minus four, and the case two has a, yes, so the one order smaller, 10 part minus five. So the because so the case one is the same parameter as a previous my FM dynamo, FM uh, subject scale modeling. So I want to compare if it works correct, same as a, previous works. And then, so I try to run a model with a finest resolution case, which I have. So, and here's a, here's a perspective of the kinetic and the energy and temperature for the both cases. And so I can show of the this LES and the answer of the DNS case is 39 and 95. So it's departing from the the uh, energy cascade straight cas cascade straightly 
the high, uh, large degree part, né? then it's uh, getting a little bit of get dangerous truncation, but we can see a large improvement in the simulation results. OK, here's a results from the case one. Then it has the evolution of the kinetic energy and magnetic energy. And so the black is the resolved DNS for reference, and blue is the unresolved DNS, and green is the LS case. So the look at the kinetic energy. So the LS results are much closer to the resolved DNS case, but still, magnetic energy is pretty less than the reference case. And but looking at the uh, work of the each three SS term, so the products of the, the SS the Reynolds stress and SS Lorentz force and SS induction term, so the Lorentz force is pretty big and so the both has a large area with a negative value. So that indicates energy transfer from resolved scale to unresolved small scale. But so looking at the lens stress, so na, there are positive areas in the middle of the convection column. Na. So this area transfer energy from small scale to large scale. This part is a very characteristic, and so na, na, we think so na, we can't represent such future by na, turbulent diffusivity. It's always sucking energy from na, resolved scale to unresolved scale. And good thing is. Uh, if we compare the uh, results uh, this time uh, with the uh, results by, by our FEM model. So, uh, yeah, details are a little bit different, but characteristics are pretty similar. So, uh, there's strong uh, negative energy transfer and the uh, positive energy transfer on the next and getting negative energy transfer. Then, even we use uh, defined uh, coordinate, defined uh, expression of the uh, for the uh, uh, SS uh, out of actions, but yeah, we can represent the uh, we can represent the process for the uh, subgrid scale term uh, yeah, pretty successfully, we believe. And so uh, when we look at the past spectrum, so uh, yeah, sure it's, it's getting a lot large uh, oscillation due to the uh, early truncations, but so the uh, magnetic energy getting closer to the. Uh, of the DNS, but still not enough. Fats wrong on, uh, but still missing in uh, our LS, LS model. So one possibility is in the uh, previous talks on it. So we can ignore an effect of the angles of the buoyancy, but I I saw on uh, in our models on uh, still on. Uh, we need to think the effect of the energy input by into the eyes of scale. And it can uh, modify the flow on the resolved scale. For example, here's a very stupid or simple test. So here's a simulation with a free resolved calculation, but I eliminate the Small scale buoyancy, buoyancy uh, corresponding with the angle of DNS and the LDS case. Then, looking at the solution, so the, the solution of the filtered DNS is very close to the results by the areas. So, this result suggests that the current on our sketching model probably doesn't capture. The effect of the small scale buoyancy. Then, how to transfer the energy into the small scale angles of the field, angles of the buoyancy to the large scale field? It should be random stress, advection time. Then, it's a still ad hoc test. I, am, I increase the model coefficient four times from the original areas. Then, here's the uh, evolution of the kinetic and magnetic energies. So now, uh, with the same format as before. So, uh, modified LS 
is a red zone, and this results in much, much closer to the uh, result of the DNS. Then, so this approach would be good to yeah, reproduct the numerical dynamos in the rotating shell. Né? But it's a large Ekman number. It, this results has a large, the case with a large Ekman number. Okay, how it will be for the more final case? Honestly, I haven't tested modified LS yet. But yes, yeah, so on a kinetic energy getting small and actually, so honestly, it's on a, uh, there's not so big improvement in uh, by the LUS in uh, looking at the uh, average energies. And there's a difference in uh, energy transfer in a reduced stress. Actually, so on a LUS Lorentz force and AC induction is getting much smaller than the uh, reduced stress. In a, because on a manic turns number is a small and then so on a, the contribution of the AC stamps, the largest contribution in the AC stamps would be becomes a range of stress. And so the positive energy flux in the middle of the component column disappears. Most of the areas on the, it has a negative energy transfer, then so the kind of energy always cascade to large scale to small scales. Such process occurs in the current, uh, in the current results. And I, quick, I looked at quickly the uh, kind of spe uh, energy spectrum as a function of the spectrum degree in the uh, absorbed DNS for the uh, Coriolis, Boranshi, Lorentz force with green, and initial terms. And so uh, we also compare the, if we can represent uh, this initial term in uh, LES. Actually, so the LES of the initial term in uh, LES is smaller than uh, original initial term in uh, resolved DNS in uh, all length scale. And I don't think this ACS term not enough to adjust this amplitude, push up to this black line. It's still too small. Probably we need to increase the amplitude of the SS buoyancy. And this amplitude is something like order of the temper, temper to 10 or something like. Looking at the, this level, so now, yeah, it's pretty close to the amplitude of the, the buoyancy term in the result of the DNS. Yeah, then probably so now, we need to apply the same stuff for the increase in the uh, stress dynamically in uh, during the simulations. But currently, so the, my, yeah, we try to implement this model, but it makes the simulation unstable. Then I'm checking the, if something is wrong in this uh, our modified model. Anyway, so the conclusion, so we apply the scale symmetry model for the numerical dynamo using for the speaker shell. Uh, using the speaker harmonic expansion. So the, so the outline of the uh, SS terms are pretty similar to the results by every finite length method. So the, even if we apply, we use a different uh, formulations, that's a good, pretty encouraging results. Né? We don't have to uh, apply the same, ta completely same shape to represent the SS terms in uh, both models. And then the stress transfer energy from the small scale to large scale in a case with a large Ekman number case, but it has a dependence on uh, Ekman number. We want to see how it will be in a more and more Ekman number case. So we plan to use the data by Lakash. You know? <laughs> so he has a very fine, that very terrible international mission results with Ekman number. Temp is a temperature minus four. So it would be good to check how such a system works in a such very, very turbulent case. And we also need to parameterize the effects of the eyes of the buoyancy in uh, our model. Probably that it, it has a potential to improve uh, our SS scale symmetry model. That's it, thanks.
Thanks, Ayurake. Any questions? Um, I was uncertain in your comparison of the kinetic energy. Um, when you compare the DNS and the LES, are you adding the subgrid scale energy to the LES estimate when you compare Honest, that or honestly, not? Honestly, not. But actually, it's on a, uh, I compare the total kinetic and magnetic energies for the each cases, each case. But actually, it's on a, in the DNS case, contribution of the small scale part is a very small, less than uh, one percent. Then, so, uh, so I think we don't have to care about. You know, we don't have to uh, truncate and uh, pick up the large scale uh, and get the energy for the comparison. Uh, yeah, it makes pretty small. Because that should be depending on what the filter with. Uh, yes, they should add up if it really yes. works. Um, I couldn't tell from the plots uh, how much. Uh, are you asking the subgrid scale model to, let's say, carry flux or carry energy? Uh, how much of the total energy is, is it? About 10%, 5%, 50%? If we take a volume average, these guys are very small because there's a lot of cancellations. So, uh, it's uh, something like, uh, yeah, less than 1%. Of the resolved energy fluxes from the buoyancy or Lorentz force, ne? but if you look at the locally, yeah, so the sometimes so the it's something like a ten percent of the resolved resolved terms. Then so the yeah, some part, probably this guy would be good insight ne? to compare with the uh, yeah so the, this case on the. Pass, uh, amplitude of the uh, AC stamps is something like, uh, yeah, one, two percent or something like, but it's, uh, it takes uh, squares. Then, so the uh, amplitude would be something like four or five percent, né? comparing with the uh, resolved component. Any more questions? No, let's thank you, working. Welcome. Well, um, I too want to thank the organizer for um, inviting me. Uh, it's been a wonderful meeting. And um, also for scheduling the photo shoot afterwards. This way, I'm not standing between you and lunch, but between you and the photo shoot, which sounds a little less onerous. <laughs> but I'll try to be on time. So this, uh, this work, uh, actually, it's also nice to be, to be following Anik, who set up the, the, the general topic of intermittency uh, quite nicely. I'll, I'll be focusing on. Uh, intermittency of the gradients of the small scale of turbulence, not the velocities themselves, the, the way she did. And um, I should say at the outset that this is work that was uh, part of uh, Perry Johnson's uh, PhD thesis. He's now at Stanford, but so he, he really did all the, all the work that I'm going to be pre presenting. Um, so uh, this is essentially going back to this old topic of small scale intermittency where uh, in, uh, as, as, the, as the Reynolds number of turbulence gets higher and higher, for example, the dissipation rate gets more uh, spatially localized and highly intermittent. Here's a visualization of the symmetric, the square of the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor, again, becoming very spiky, very intermittent. This is something that's been looked at for quite a, a while. If you look at the anti-symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor, these are the worms that are also highly intermittent, but also are spatially distributed in a very non-trivial way. There's kind of a, it's a kind of hierarchical organization of the spatial distribution of, of vorticity. Uh, I, show, I thought I'd show a, an animation which uh, we, we uh, built a few years ago, which is kind of interesting, which is uh, the, the red are the uh, actual vor entropy, so uh, uh, actually, yeah, so the square of the vorticity at the small scales. And then in gray is a filtered uh, vorticity magnitude. Uh, and then we've taken out all the small scale vorticity outside of what's contained inside these, uh, these uh, larger scale vortices. So you can see the vorticity, the large scale vorticity kind of twisting the small scale vorticity around and, and generating the uh, inside kind of the straining fields that strains the small scale. So it's kind of an animation that, that I like to show. But again, just, just to show that uh, things are quite intermittent. 
Um, so uh, quantitatively, one of the quantitative uh, uh, implications of this is, is a deviation from Kolmogorov 41, uh, which uh, assumes that everything depends on just the mean dissipation, so the average dissipation rate is going to go like this times Reynolds number to the zero, but then also any high order moments, for example, if I take the m, m uh, half, uh, why I take the half is going to become evident uh, immediately, uh, that this also, even these high order moments of the dissipation would not scale in any non-trivial way, essentially go like Reynolds number to the zero. So for example, ratios of the mth power of the velocity gradient uh, to the mth power normalized by the square will also go like Reynolds number to the zero. That's the prediction from the classic Kolmogorov 41 in the absence of intermittency. And then, of course, it's well known that the fact that the uh, dissipation rate will accumulate in these highly spiky distributions, and as the Reynolds number gets higher and higher, this becomes more prominent, will give rise to power law scaling of things like high order moments of the velocity gradient. So for example, for m equals 4, you get the well-known flatness uh, the increase of flatness with Reynolds number, uh, our lambda here going 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and you get this kind of power law increase of the flatness uh, away from the, the value of 3 that is appropriate for Gaussian uh, value. So, so that, that's one of the uh, uh, well-known uh, observations. Now this, this has been described in the past uh, uh, via a number of uh, models, uh, multifractals, Shalevec, P models, shell models, uh, all have kind of this generalization of Kolmogorov, which essentially says you still have, you think of this cascade of energy from large to small scales, however, it's, it becomes spatially localized. Some of these eddies get more energy than the others, and then it gets sort of cumulatively, perhaps multiplicatively more intermittent, and, uh, and that's, and that's uh, the, the different models and so on are, are of course, described nicely in, a, in the monograph by Uriel Frisch. Now, um, one of the drawbacks of these kind of descriptions is that there is very little uh, connection with Navier-Stokes equations, very little fluid mechanics that's really contained in these. They, they deal typically with scalars like the dissipation or the entropy, which, uh, which there's a lot of geometric uh, uh, information that's been kind of erased and is not connected. And so uh, what I'd like to do today is we will take the, 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 the view that we'd like to uh, uh, come up with a, a reduced order description that will perhaps supplant some of these models, but that is somehow more grounded in Navier-Stokes equations. Um, therefore, we, it's kind of obvious this has to be done in a Lagrangian frame. It'll be easier uh, to have a really de reduced order description of this. And we should be hopefully dealing with vectors and tensors rather than the, just scalars. And so the, the, the object we'll be interested in is the full velocity gradient tensor, which are essentially those velocity increments that Anik talked about. So what she looked at were, or described, essentially subsets of this, uh, velocity increments in a particular direction, the longitudinal or the transverse. This is a complete description of all the directions and all velocity components, so to speak. Um, so that's, that's what I'd like to discuss here. And, and since time is short, I, let me give you the punchline uh, um, at, the, at the start. Uh, so what we'll, what we'll end up finding is that um, we'll have a kind of a cascade model in which the, there is a local part which will come from the Navier-Stokes equations, which, which will mostly be dominated by the self-stretching of the velocity gradient tensor. That will come from Navier-Stokes equations. However, we will, to, to really be able to go to arbitrarily high Reynolds numbers, we will need to have a non-local part of the cascade where this whole process is embedded in some kind of environment where there's going to be a, a surrounding or an average time scale uh, or dissipation rate. And, and then that will have to also be uh, sequenced kind of multiplicatively. So, so there'll be a local part which comes from Navier-Stokes and a non-local part where we will essentially use time scale separation arguments to do the modeling for the background terms that will have stochastic forcing and, and, and time scales that will be kind of the local environment. So, so it'll be a picture like this where we have an eddy cascade that will be local, uh, which will be essentially this kind of equation, but it'll be uh, embedded in an environment which itself will come from the accumulation of this. Uh, anyway, it'll, it'll become a little clearer later, but it'll ha be kind of a, a model that combines local part and non-local parts, but will we'll be able to, ar to reach arbitrarily high Reynolds numbers. So as a result, uh, what I'll present is a little machine uh, which will consist of, uh, I don't know, an order of small, you know, tens, 
maybe 40, 50 stochastic differential equations for the velocity gradient at different scales, these, these different scales. This scale ratio, by the way, will be about a factor of 10, so it'll be kind of, we'll be able to use scale separation arguments to model things. But anyway, in the end, you'll end up with maybe 50 or so stochastic differential equations where we'll be able to uh, you know, reach arbitrarily high Reynolds numbers and describe things like vorticity alignments with strain rate, uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and the growth of intermittency, um, uh, which are all important and, and might be useful for you know, astrophysical applications if you need some more detailed information about these geometric gradient statistics uh, at very, very high Reynolds numbers at the smallest scales. So that's the, that's the, that's the plan. Um, so, uh, in terms of what, what are the phenomenological things that we'd like the model to describe, for example, these long tails that Anik talked about, uh, for the longitudinal, there's skewness, so that's asymmetric, the transverse gradients are symmetric, this growth of flatness with Reynolds number, but then also things like the alignment of the intermediate eigenvector of the strain rate tensor, so the symmetric part, uh, it, its intermediate eigenvector is typically uh, where the vorticity likes to be aligned, things of this sort we'd also like to describe, a model like this should describe. Um, so let's start with, uh, so we'll be looking at the gradients. Now the, the effect uh, is, is the simplest way to look at it is in a 1D example, with the sort of the inviscid Burgers equation, and we'll be looking at the gradient. So in this case, it's very easy to see where the intermittency comes from. So you take the gradient of this equation, so just du dx, um, and you will find that the Lagrangian derivative of this du dx is minus du dx squared. So you take an additional derivative of this advective term, and on the right-hand side ends up a minus a squared, which tells you that if initially the gradient is negative, it'll grow very quickly, and there's a finite time singularity that Anik also mentioned. Uh, there's a finite time singularity essentially showing where this growth, sudden growth, and also this condensation of these large gradients onto smaller subsets of the available space. This is, of course, a 1D, highly compressible example, but it gives kind of the flavor of what I'll be talking about. So this is a scale example, a finite singularity for negative initial gradients, showing that it's very natural that you get this growth of intermittency. Now we do it for the full velocity gradient in 3D. So you take the gradient of, uh, of, of the Navier-Stokes equations, and you end up with an equation like this which has the first part is, again, it's kind of an a squared minus a squared term, but in a matrix sense. You take the trace out because this needs to remain divergence-free. And then this is, this is a closed term. That's the, 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 the part, if you, if, you, if you neglect all these other terms, you get to what's a restricted, what's called restricted Euler equation, which VFOS uh, looked at uh, some decades ago. And uh, these, are, these terms are unclosed. They contain the, the effects of pressure through the pressure Hessian. The viscous effects, so again, non-local in the terms that we, I, need, I would need A uh, at different neighboring points to evaluate this term. And then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll add a stochastic forcing uh, uh, because it turns out we, we need it. So, but in principle, what this represents is a set of nine, right? These are nine uh, ODEs. They're not closed, and, uh, and they're in a Lagrangian frame. So we'll take this to be the Lagrangian derivative. So we're, we're imagining we're following kind of fluid elements in isotropic turbulence, and we're just trying to see what does the velocity gradient look like as a function of time. So that's, that's it. So right now, so far, we really only have nine or eight because it's trace-free. We really have eight ODEs. And how much can we learn from that kind of thing? And again, I think the, the main term is the self-stretching term. We're very familiar with the vorticity stretching, but it turns out the strain rate itself acts on itself and the, the, to rotate itself and, and so on. So that's all contained in this term. So uh, here's a brief history of the various types of models that have been proposed, and I'll just focus uh, as an example on the pressure Hessian, and I'll show you our latest uh, version of this which uh, we call uh, something, uh, I forget what, what we call it. But anyway, the, the, the simplest way to motivate this particular model is to, remember, we're interested in the pressure Hessian. So we're going to make the assumption that the pressure itself, if I follow a fluid particle, is a, very, is a slow move, moving variable. So I, I now do a time separation argument, and it'll be time scales on the order of 10 ratio that later on we'll, we'll see is needed. And so on that time scale, I'm going to assume that the pressure is constant if I follow a fluid particle for a short amount of time, that seems reasonable. Then I take twice the gradient of that equation, and what you end essentially end up with is the time derivative of the pressure Hessian is equal to this uh, Olroyd uh, convective derivative. So essentially, you're saying that the Olroyd derivative is zero of the pressure Hessian. And it's in 
in time, if I follow the Lagrangian time history, it just means that the pressure Hessian is being rotated and strained and deformed by the velocity gradient in this way. And it turns out that this simple equation has a, has a if I assume that the velocity gradient is constant, so again, that's going to be a time scale separation argument as far as the pressure Hessian is concerned, I get as a solution of this, this uh, matrix exponential type term that takes the initial condition, the initial pressure Hessian, and multiplies it on two sides. And, uh, and, and this can essentially, this, so this is, the, this is one version of the model where I take some initial condition and I use this map, this, def, this exponential map on both sides, and I get a model for the pressure Hessian. Now, I need this, this initial condition for the pressure Hessian. And what we did in 2006 with the Laurent Chevillard, we, we assumed that that was an isotropic tensor. So not the full pressure Hessian being isotropic, which is what VFOS assumed, but this Lagrangian precursor of the pressure Hessian being an isotropic tensor. Uh, that turned out to have some uh, limitations. And uh, so what uh, Perry f felt he could do is instead is use an, an earlier result that uh, Michael Vilcek has had uh, developed, which is to say, for isotropic turbulence, let's assume that the turbulence is Gaussian. And then it turns out that the pressure Hessian of a Gaussian field is not an isotropic tensor, but it depends on the gradients themselves. But you can write it down analytically. So, so Michael had essentially calculated uh, analytically what the pressure Hessian would be for a Gaussian velocity field. That can be done. And so that's the model we use for this uh, initial condition. And then we multiply it by both sides with this matrix exponential. And essentially, then what you end up with is a model that has the following uh, uh, shape. So again, it's a, now it's a stochastic differential equation because I'm going to have to add a stochastic forcing. So here's the self-stretching part. This H essentially contains that closure that assumes the Gaussian field that I just described. Now, it has a parameter. This, this has a parameter, which is the time scale of the smallest uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of, of how long I've waited. You see, I need to, I have this uh, time evolution, and I have a solution that depends on time. And then I say, well, how, how long do I wait? So, I, so that's a turn over time scale that's, that's arbitrary. So that's, uh, that's essentially, that, that depends on it. So it's a scalar parameter. And then the forcing has two parameters that need to be prescribed, which is the amplitude of the forcing for the symmetric and the anti-symmetric part. So there's three parameters right now. They get fixed by three kinematic conditions, namely that the, uh, uh, this time scale needs to be the Kolmogorov time scale, which can be expressed in terms of the square of the strain rate and the viscosity itself. So I, I, I know it in some sense, so that, so that this model gives the right Kolmogorov time scale. So that's one condition. And then the other two uh, get fixed by kinematic conditions that the average Q and R, so the scalar invariance of the velocity gradient, and so that has to be zero, the average of it. So, so these parameters get adjusted that way. So they're, they're free parameters, but they can be adjusted through the self-consistency. And then if, if you run this model, so now I'm running you know, nine stochastic differential equations with no additional parameters to, to play around with, and I get things like signals like A11 this way. These are different realizations. Uh, A12, so this is the, the, the transverse, the longitudinal one. And I can look at PDFs and so on. And I find, indeed, that it's skewed. So I get a nice skewness of close to minus 1 half. Um, and I get a kurtosis here, which I forget what, what was the number, but maybe 7 or something. And, and it's symmetric, so that, that PDF is symmetric. And, and, and I get a fixed kurtosis, which means that, in some sense, it behaves like a fixed Reynolds number, and it's a moderate Reynolds number. It's about 100, let's say, our land of 100. So this model, by itself, in a way, I have lost the ability to dial in a Reynolds number, and I cannot, it, we've tried very hard, with uh, a single set of nine ordinary dif or stochastic differential equations, uh, we were simply unable to go to arbitrarily high Reynolds numbers. It, we always stuck with this Reynolds number. Uh, although a lot of geometric qualitative features were reproduced, uh, we could not go to you know our land a thousand or ten thousand, hundred thousand. It just it just wouldn't wouldn't work. So so what Perry uh, suggested was well, why don't we couple several of these and have some kind of you know shell? But it's it's as I'm going to argue, it's not really a shell model, but a kind of an idea where, as I told you, I need a time scale. I need that Kolmogorov time scale. So why not get that time scale from uh, from a precursor shell. So the easiest way to think about it is as follows, is to think that I'm doing the simulation at the Kolmogorov scale. So this A super N now is the smallest one at the Kolmogorov scale, so the, the real velocity gradient at the smallest possible scales. I'm going to assume, essentially, that this is not 
uh, uh, that the time scale I needed for that shell isn't going to be the overall Kolmogorov time scale, but it's going to be a localized time scale that lives in this neighborhood, this region where this eddy is evolving. And however, that time scale, I'm going to get it by evaluating the Kolmogorov time scale, uh, not of the overall flow, but of, of a bigger a shell that represents the larger scales in this overall neighborhood of the flow. Okay? So uh, that's uh, so, and then, and then you string several of these together. So, so we're going to have the time scales are going to be multiples of the Kolmogorov time scale, where this beta is going to be the scale ratio, the time scale ratio between these levels. Okay? Now it turns out that is now, unfortunately, a free parameter. And to get the proper results, to have the scale in the right way with Reynolds number, the pre, this free parameter ends up being a time scale ratio of about 10. The nice thing about getting such a big number is that, remember, we use time scale separation arguments for all these things, you know, the pressure being constant over that time and so on and so forth. So it does use this idea of a time scale separation. So getting a, a number that's big uh, turned out to be nice in that, in that sense. But, you know, it could have been 15 or 8 or 30. Uh, so that is still 10. So it would be very nice to get that number out of Navier-Stokes. But that we have not been able to do yet. Um, so uh, anyway, that's a scale separation that's needed in a model. But it, so therefore, it's not a, sh a shell model. The shell models typically have scale ratios of two, where you have kind of an eddy splitting into two, and so on and so forth, scale ratio of two, um, which, which is not the case here. Here, the local interactions, again, the local cascade of energy is through this quadratic nonlinearity, which is captured directly from Navier-Stokes. Okay? It is only these highly non-local uh, effects uh, through the forcing, but also this dissipative uh, relaxation term here from the pressure Hessian and the viscous term that have this kind of mean field type time scale, but which is still being accumulated in this, uh, in this way. So again, non-local in scale, the local in scale interactions come from Navier-Stokes, and the non-local interactions come from these closures that are physically motivated, as I mentioned before. Now, what, what do we get? So at the first level, yeah, for example, here, time series of A11. Uh, at the next level, you can see this accumulation. Now you really have a dramatic accumulation of intermittency uh, in, in, in these time signals. Uh, quantitatively now, uh, what you can uh, do is, uh, is plot the usual PDFs of velocity gradients. But now the Reynolds number can go very high. Uh, here, I've compared one of these is a, is a fourth, our lambda for 400. But then these, these get uh, very, very uh, much higher very quickly. Uh, this is probably uh, one of the nicest results. So the, the, the colored, uh, the, the symbols, uh, the blue and, the, and the, the squares are the from this model as a function of R e lambda. So now you know we're going to R e lambda of 10 to the six. So and this can go on and on. Um, so it's very, very economical, very cheap to run. Uh, results we get, uh, which are interesting, is in this case the the skewness uh, also uh, goes up. The so no, this is the skewness. I'm sorry, this is the negative of the skewness. This is the flatness for the longitudinal and the transverse. So what's interesting is the transverse flatness uh, intermittency is higher than the longitudinal, but the scaling exponent with Reynolds number in this case is identical. In fact, that's actually a kinematic condition that was uh, talked about uh, some years ago. But this the model that reproduces that very nicely. And then data are the, the other symbols. Uh, if you if you again if you choose beta equals ten, then this exponent alpha that I talked at the beginning, which is the scaling exponent with Reynolds number of the gradients. Uh, again, uh, compared with data and some of the other Shea Levesque and P model. Uh, so just look at the red, red circles are the predictions from this model as function of the moment order and compared with some data. So again, giving very nice kind of growth of this uh, exponent with, uh, with, the, uh, with the order of the moment as function of Reynolds number. But in addition, uh, this model provides you with, uh, with all sorts of geometric information because it's very rich, because it says the full velocity gradient tensor. So things like, again, for the experts, uh, things like the joint PDF of these velocity gradient invariants shows this VFOS tail very nicely compared with DNS. The alignments of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the vorticity with the eigendirection of the strain rate tensor, very nice. Uh, and th here's the, the dashed lines, I believe, are the uh, are the uh, DNS results at that Reynolds number. And, and these results have a weak Reynolds number dependence, which we also capture here. I guess I'm not showing it here. And then this is, the, this, is a, this S parameter that 
that tells you whether the velocity gradient is more uh, axisymmetric, ex uh, axis axisymmetric expansion or contraction. The PDF of it, again, compared with the DNS, uh, quite nice uh, results. So uh, again, as a, as a summary, here's a little machinery uh, that, again, uh, the, you know, if I have, if I need to go to a Reynolds number that's very high, uh, if I need three levels, so three levels would correspond to a time scale ratio of 1,000. Um, which, uh, which is a very high Reynolds number because the, the, the time scale ratio goes, uh, goes like R, R E lamb. So, so there's a, the, the, this, uh, this can go uh, very high. And then for each of these levels, I need nine uh, stochastic differential equations. So in this, in this case, it'd be 27 equations. If I go to n equals five or six, like the results I showed, then you can go to R E lambda of 10 to the five or 10 to the six. Uh, and, uh, and Pretty good agreements with uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the results. So again, uh, a low order model. Uh, the term that really drives the intermittency growth comes directly from the Navier-Stokes. So it's not something that's put in by hand. Uh, the the restrictive te terms, because if I don't add these, then I get finite time singularities. The, the resistive terms are mainly pressure Hessian and also a little bit of viscous terms come from these physically motivated uh, 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 closures. Um, again, it predicts multiple things. It has four scalar parameters. Three of those can be fixed self-consistently by sort of an internal self-consistency. But the scale ratio, uh, beta, uh, is, is still uh, has something that needs to be fitted. So that's, that's uh, I would say, w room for further developments. Hopefully, that, that, if that were to come from out of Navier-Stokes, I think we'd, uh, we'd, uh, that would be really very nice. But if you need an operational model to predict statistics, of velocity gradients and arbitrarily high Reynolds numbers, this is now a nice little machine that you can apply to different things. Now, it can also be generalized, I guess, as outlook. Um, there is nothing that prevents you from adding a rotation to this uh, equation. So uh, Yi Li, uh, some, some years ago, did that. And then he, he took this and, and, and projected it further onto the longitudinal and transverse direction, a bit like uh, what Anik uh, just described. And then, for example, was able to show that how vorticity would, uh, how, how frame rotation would reduce some of the intermittency. Uh, but here you can do it for the full uh, velocity gradient. To magnetic fields, this kind of modeling, I guess there are some initial uh, attempts as well. Um, and then the, the other problem, of course, is that I still need to run simulations, right? I need to run the stochastic differential equations on a computer and then see what I get. And the only thing is it's, you know, 60 or 80 degrees of freedom rather than 10 to the nine or 10 to the 10 if I need to do DNS. But it's still, it's kind of uh, not satisfying that I need to run the simulation. So there, there are some analytical approaches for these kind of models uh, based on instantons and, and this uh, MSR path integral methods that, 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 that is being looked at by, uh, by some, some people, which might be, uh, there might be some hope to actually do analysis on these uh, uh, stochastic differential equations. And with that, I'll be very happy to take any questions. And thank you. Are there any questions for Charles? Um, Charles, just uh, maybe it's a little bit distant, but often uh, Ron Adrian has advocated looking at the complex eigenvalue of DUI DXJ to find structures. Uh, does all the machinery that you have here, could you use it to find structures? or? The other question, I guess, is uh, Ron uses that uh, and argues that it finds a vortex. Uh, does this say anything about that? Um, so, you know, the, the, the quick answer is, in some sense, yes, I can, I can get take A and look at the complex eigenvalues of it. So I, this will predict, for example, the statistics, you know, how likely is it to get the complex eigenvalues and so on. What Ron, what you're talking about is goes a step beyond because now you need spatial coherence. So th this is still a single point description. I'm only getting the probability of a, any arbitrary point to have these things. What you're talking about is you, you now need some kind of spatial information, which just would not give you.
probably not. I think I, 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 what, what tells us about Navier-Stokes is the, is the difficulties we had to actually have get to a model where if you add a Gau I guess I didn't talk about the, the forcing is a Gaussian forcing, is to have a model where you add a Gaussian forcing that has this quadratic nonlinearity and doesn't blow up. Uh, for example, um, you know, if we, if we use a linear damping, so instead of this H, if I just put a 1 over minus some kind of ti single time scale a linear damping, which would be the first thing, that, you know, half the initial conditions will blow up. And then we tried some other things like taking these matrix exponentials and expanding them and only keeping a few points. Then we run for quite a long time and seems okay, and then it blows up. So it, it, um, <laughs> so I would say it really likes to blow up, and, and, and we really needed to have these exponential terms that would really grow the damping then really becomes huge to really prevent it from blowing up. I don't know whether that's telling us something interesting. But. Any more questions for Charles? Um, I think, uh, Charles, you hinted at uh, energy transfer when you took like A11 times a tau. Uh, maybe I wasn't interpreting that tau correctly. Tau is a time scale, uh, so that's... Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, would it say anything about uh, tau ij, sij yeah. in what you've done? Yeah, yeah. So we could, we haven't done it yet. I guess, uh, you know, you could take the A ij from the small scale. Um, no. You would take the, the, the Sij from the large scales and you would multiply it by the Aij, Aji from the small scales to generate a stress-like term from the next shell. And that, would, um, that could be kind of perhaps interpreted as an energy transfer. We have not, that is not something we've looked at, but that, that might be interesting to, to do. Let's thank Charles again. Thank you. And I invite everyone for the photo right up front.